I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. Everybody and welcome back to Hellbent for Horror, and this is part two of The Killer Elite, my favorite horror movies of 2023. Now, I've heard from you folks after part one, and I will say that the responses to my choices are as eclectic as the choices were themselves. And we just scratched the surface in part one. We're going to hurl right into part two because, believe it or not, there are quite a few movies still on my list that I want to get through to hopefully encourage you folks to take a look at movies that maybe you passed up, maybe you didn't even know about, but also even ones that maybe you thought were just too overhyped. Some of them actually lived up to that hype, folks, and I will see if I can give you a little bit of an an idea of why I love these movies. Without any further ado, let's just roll right into it because we've got a list going. So here we go. Part two of The Killer Elite. Our next movie on my list is a Christmas horror movie. Oh my goodness, a Christmas horror movie. Are you crazy? Get out of (laughs) here. Yeah, I know. Uh, Most Christmas horror movies are a mixed bag at best. And uh, really, it was a pretty small subgenre until about a decade ago. Uh, We started seeing an uptick of movies that were dealing with the Christmas holiday in a horrific manner. And with that, I really like this one. And I think part of the reason that I like this one is that it's not just a Christmas horror movie. It's one of the several subgenres that the movie is trying to subvert. And is Jen Wexler's The Sacrifice Game. And it's a follow-up to her cult favorite, The Ranger from 2018. A punk rock movie that kind of evokes the punk rock sentiment of the early 90s. And this movie uh, goes with a much older feel. It's like a classic rock album in some ways. It starts in 1971, has very much that 70s feel. This is a movie that subverts not only uh, the subgenres inside of horror, but also subverts expectations within those and plays with social commentary quite a bit. Now, Sacrifice Game has two different storylines that are going on. And of course, like a good horror movie, these two weird paths are going to intersect. And that's where things are going to start getting crazy. The first of the storylines that we follow is this group of thrill killers, three men, one woman, called the Christmas Killers. And we're uh, Christmas of 1971. We're watching them staking out a house while carolers are outside of it. The husband and wife are sitting there listening to the wonderful songs. They applaud as the carolers go away. These people walk up, knock on the door. Husband opens the door, gets stabbed right in the throat, and carnage ensues. And we get a really cool opening sequence here where we don't go inside of the house. We watch the murders through the windows as the camera goes around the house. It's very much like John Carpenter's Halloween. It's also very much like Dario Argento's Tenebrae. And I really love this opening sequence. And this is how we're introduced to one of the storylines. We don't know why these people are doing what they're doing, but we see that there's definitely a ritualistic aspect to it. Uh, They're smearing the blood of the woman on the windows in a symbol, but we also see the flaying of some skin, and it looks like what they're taking is birthmarks. We're not necessarily sure. They're just taking flaps of skin off of people and leaving. So we have that one story, and we're following these people, and we realize they look as if they're supposed to be the last house on the left Krug's group. Instead of Krug being in charge, though, we essentially have the woman who's involved in this group as the de facto ruler. But she does not let anybody know that she's actually ruling. She lets the blowhard guy continue to take all the credit, but she's the one who comes up with the ideas and the suggestions. And essentially, they are doing some kind of weird bidding of hers from a book that she has gotten some spells and incantations from. They're trying to get something out of the other world, folks. We're going to have to find out what that is. We've got to take this ride. 
So where is the destination? Well, it happens to be the second storyline that we've got going here. And that is the Black Veil School for Girls. It's up on top of this snowy mountain. There is a town below it. Uh, it is totally secluded. This school is an intimidating campus, to say the least. It looks like a medieval fortress. Actually, it is inside, it looks a lot like a prison. Very monochromatic. All the hallways go into one big room. That's essentially where the guards would be if it was not a school for girls. And I will say that for whatever they're supposed to be teaching these girls, it seems like all they're really teaching them is conformity. There's uh, books in the basement that are not supposed to be read, so there's an entire library of books that they don't want the girls to read. Uh, there is news about the Christmas killers, and when the headmistress hears the girls speaking about something that's actually happening out there that could be dangerous to them, she says, oh, you don't have to think about those things. It's ridiculous to scare yourselves with that kind of tabloid trash. So we're not sure what exactly uh, the motto is supposed to mean when it says Black Veil girls look out for each other. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of that at all. The only people who seem to be looking out for each other are the outsiders, and we get to meet some outsiders here. Essentially, you have these girls who are left behind by their families having to stay through the Christmas holiday, and one teacher who's being kind of punished for the stuff that she's teaching, uh, she has to stay there as well. So we have these three girls, and Samantha is one. We find out that Samantha is kind of abandoned by her father. Uh, she survived a car accident with her mother. Uh, mother perished in it, and it seems that dad just can't look at her. So she's sacrificed uh, into this uh, place uh, for the holidays. The other girl is Clara, and we don't really know much about Clara because Clara doesn't want us to know dick about her. She's a stoic. She's antisocial. She prefers to be invisible. She wants to, if she could, she'd uh, just kind of fade into the wallpaper. So she's not a lot of fun to be around, and she essentially tells everybody, listen, I'm not very good at human interaction. So these two are going to be watched over by Rose, who is the teacher who is trying her best to make it through this, uh, this semester. We get that she's new. We get that she really wants to be somewhere else, that she's intimidated by what's going on. She's going to try and make this a damn good holiday for these two girls. Of course, she has no idea what's about to happen as there's a knock on the door. And our first storyline meets our second storyline. And what I'll say is just when you think you know what's going to happen in this story, it goes somewhere else. I really like what Jen Wexler does with this movie. And it really gets creepy as the movie goes on. And it also gets funny. The comedy uh, comes from the very subversive messages of the sacrifice game. There's plenty of bloodletting. Uh, there's some crazy supernatural stuff. And uh, the movie goes further than I expected it to go. I really recommend The Sacrifice Game. It's a creepy horror film. Hey, the way that it looks, especially if you're taking a look at what Jen Wexler did before in The Ranger, which felt like a 1992-93 punk rock album uh, or CD, uh, this one feels a lot like a classic rock album, but that's only on the surface. Once you get underneath the story and you give it a spin, you get a dose of that humor and that social commentary and how they kick over the chessboard in that finale, you realize this is a punk rock movie too. There's a trend in recent horror movies that I really appreciate and I want to talk about a little bit. And it has to do with telling a story uh, where the story itself is not so original. It's something that you kind of know, but it's told through a different perspective. Uh, basically flipping a switch or changing the filter or lens on the camera so that we're seeing the story from a different viewpoint. Now, often when we're talking about that, yes, we're talking about seeing a movie uh, through a woman woman's eyes or a person of color, but there's also a different version of that looking through the lens of someone who is not someone that we would normally be sympathetic with as the lead in a movie. And I had seen this before with a movie called La Llorona. It came out in 2019. It's not the La Llorona that New Line Cinema had that year. This is the one from Guatemala directed by Jairo Bustamante. And essentially, in that movie, we're following a family 
that is part of a dictatorship that tortured a bunch of people. And the father in that movie is being haunted by La Llorona because of what he's done to mothers and children in the form of torture for this regime. And we're seeing this regime come down, topple. And it was a really fascinating movie because it took fact and fiction, put them together, and took a ghost story that we think we know and gave it different purpose. And this year, there was the same kind of thing that I really, really liked in a movie called In My Mother's Skin. Now, on the surface, when we look at this movie, probably the the, the comparison that will, will most likely come up with most people would be to Guillermo del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth, because this movie feels uh, uh, like it's in that world of fantasy and also has this horror element to it. But there's a major difference between Pan's Labyrinth and In My Mother's Skin that really makes an impact to where the story decides to go. And that's that this is a story told from people who profited on World War II by being on the side of the Japanese. They're actually people who live in the Philippines, in the Philippine Islands. And this is a Manila film, a movie by a Manilan director named Kenneth Dagaton. And this is his sophomore film. So this takes place in World War II, 1945, the Philippine Islands. It's coming to an end. Japan is losing. And there is this rich family, a wealthy Filipino family. We see this house. It looks like uh, one of those southern homes, the antebellums down south, sitting in the middle of the jungle. And we are watching this family trying to figure out how they're going to survive as the Allies are coming. The Japanese army is no longer a viable source. And so being that there's anarchy and chaos because the war is coming to an end and those that profited on it are about to be on the outside looking in, there are all sorts of rumors around these rich families. And so we meet this father, the patriarch of the family named Aldo, and allegedly he has stolen in the gold that the Japanese uh, army had hidden somewhere near where he lives. And allegedly that gold is hidden somewhere inside of his mansion. And he decides it's going to be best for him and his family if he decides to meet the Americans halfway. So he's going to ride off into the sunset trying to get help from the Americans. Now, in that time period, he's leaving his family, his daughter and his son and his wife. And his wife is dying of consumption. She's essentially coughing up her lungs. And in this story, we start to see the world as we would through Pan's Labyrinth of a girl who goes into the woods to find a supernatural being. And this, this entity, this supernatural God that's out in the jungle is going to grant her wishes just for a few small things on her side. Well, this being decides it can perhaps help mom, but the daughter has to feed the mother a certain thing. And with that, we're not sure what's going to be left of mom once this thing gets inside of her. So this is a really interesting, suspenseful story, and it's really creepy. And one of the things that I really love about this movie, and there's many different reasons that I pick the best of. Sometimes it's uh, an original idea. Sometimes it's really scary. Uh, sometimes it's just a really good story told well. Uh, sometimes it's something that catches me by surprise. And sometimes it's a really good monster. There's a couple of those things here. I will say that I love the monster that's in here. And it's really subtle in how it changes as the movie movie goes on. But we see this beautiful woman. And then there's this whole thing about cicadas that are around this area. And she's wearing this crown that looks like these filament wings that would be on an insect. There's all sorts of really interesting little details in here. But what is really disturbing about this movie is where it decides to go. And there are people who may look at this movie in my mother's skin and say, well, this is not a horror movie. And I will say, I would argue you about that. One of the things that I talk about with horror is that horror is so subjective. It's incredibly hard to be able to say that a horror movie is something that scares you because what scares me may not scare you at all. So one of the things that I usually ask people to see whether or not it's a dark fantasy or it's a horror movie is... What is the emotional impact that the filmmaker wants you to go home with? 
out of all the things that they can use to tell the story, why do they tell the story the way that they do? And if the thing that they leave you with is this sense of dread, this somber state, this punch to the gut, chances are it's a horror movie. And with that in mind, I'll let you know that there is a bit of a gut punch at the end of In My Mother's Skin. I certainly hope you enjoy it if you decide to watch it. The next movie that I want to talk about that flips the filter a little bit and shows us the world from a non-traditional character that we're used to seeing would be Hua Serra, the Bone Woman out of Mexico. And this is a movie that has a first-time director, first-time writer-director, Michelle Garza Cervera in charge. And this is a movie that's set in Mexico. It's set in a world where the maternal instinct is most important. It's actually a spiritual transcendent thing. It's part of the religion. It's a world where the machismo of the patriarch matters more than anything as well. And you have family being uh, this rigid, strong support. The rest of the world's not going to care. You better stay with your family. It's that kind of background that this movie's on. And where this movie movie changes the filter and the focus is the main character and the dilemma that's there. So it's very rare to find a movie that talks about motherhood in the way that this film does and the idea of how we feel about family. It's been, uh, I think the Babadook is the one that comes to mind the most for me, where it shows a woman's perspective on what it's like to bear a child and what it is like to uh, be a single mother bringing up a child. And there are things that are in the Babadook that really bump up against people's expectations. And so they, <laughs> there are people who really uh, can't stand the Babadook because of it. I'm not one of them. Because we are taught most of the time, especially in horror, that the mother, the maternal instinct, is being used as part of the suspense mechanism for the story that's being told. The threat is to the child. The threat is to the innocent one. And the mother will risk everything to be able to keep that child alive. The maternal instinct reigns forever, is what a lot of these movies tend to say. And that is not where Sarah is going to go. So be forewarned. If you uh, blanch at the, at the uh, traditions being toppled, you may not enjoy this movie as much. But I really liked it because we're seeing a very honest portrayal of someone who isn't like the rest of her family, someone who is promiscuous, someone who has a lifestyle that is not necessarily about settling down and having children, but she's caught up in this world. And it is part of the culture. The movie starts with this brilliant visual image of these women climbing these stairs on a mountainside. And they climb up these stairs and they're sweating, and they've got these flowers, and you can tell that it's laborious for these women. They get up there, and there's an altar, and they're leaving the flowers there. And as the camera pulls out, we realize that they are underneath an enormous religious statue. I believe it's the Virgin Mary, and it's looking over this entire town. So there's this ritual that must be done. Why are they going up there? Because this is to bless a child into your life. So these are people who have not had children at a certain age, and they're going up these stairs with their family, and they're pledging themselves, they're pledging their womb to bringing in a child. So our main character, Valeria, has not had a child with her husband, Raul, and they are finally pregnant. Now we see Valeria, and she seems like a very well put together person. Uh, she seems like the perfect wife. She's very much seemingly in tune with her family. But as time goes on, we realize that a lot of this is a facade and that the family is supporting her more for who she will become as a mother than who she has been as a human being. So we know that she used to be a punker. She's been promiscuous. She's had girlfriends. This life still haunts her. She longs for it. One night, she's on the balcony in her apartment building, 
And she looks across the way, and there's a woman on the balcony across. And she's watching the woman, and she waves at the woman. The woman does not respond at first. And then the woman slowly puts her leg over the side of the balcony. And they're on, say, the fifth floor. And the woman looks right at Valeria and then jumps and smashes to the ground. We see her legs shatter. She's laying there in a crumble. But this woman, we see her struggling to get up and we hear the sound of snapping bones. And Valeria is screaming. So she runs in to get Raul. Raul comes out. There's no woman there. And the sound of snapping bones, this brittleness, this fragility is going to be permeating through this entire movie. There is a fragileness and there is a brittleness to the relationships that she has with Raul, that she has with her family, that she has with other friends in this life that she's living now. And she starts having these hallucinations that her own bones are breaking. When she gets up, her arm breaks. All this stuff is happening in her head, it seems, but it also seems that there is something that is trying to consume her. She may be cursed, there may be some dark magic that the family needs to try to counteract. But whatever it is, there is this creature that is legendary that seems to be coming after Valeria and her child. So, the name, who is Sarah, the Bone Woman, where does that come from? Well, the title comes from folklore, a mysterious female figure that was in the desert and roamed the desert and gathered bones and brought the dead back to life, essentially, by assembling the entire skeleton, and then she would sing to it. And her song would bring the deceased creature back to life and give it freedom to roam. So there's a little bit of metaphor going on in why this is the creature that's coming after uh, Valeria. And I will say, it is a slow burn, but when it starts going, there's some amazingly disturbing visual images. Is it psychological? Is it actually happening? Well, you'll have to watch the movie to find out. I will say what really sells this movie to me is this is a movie that shows people being human. This is someone who normally would be a side character that dies because she's promiscuous, because she's duplicitous. And it shows how there is so much pressure that a family can put on someone to make them have the lifestyle that they demand that person to have. And maybe this monster is not the worst thing that could happen, right? Anyway, who is Sarah, the bone woman, one of the great ones of 2023? The next movie I'm going to talk about is another in the line of movies that take something that you know and then flip the switch a little bit and change the filter so that we're looking at the story through characters we don't normally see. And the story that's being told is a rather old one in this new film. The story is the 1818 novel Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And what we have here are two women, one woman who is into deep obsession and the other that is deep in grief and guilt. And the name of this movie is Birth Rebirth, and it is the first feature film of Laura Moss. She also co-wrote the screenplay with Brendan O'Brien. So Birth Rebirth has two main characters, both in the same hospital. So the first character is Dr. Rose Casper, and she's the pathologist of this hospital. And so she spends her time in the morgue with dead bodies. And it's probably not the worst thing that could possibly happen for her because she's not very good with people who are breathing. She's very good with uh, biological and microbial things. She's very good at medicine. She's very good at charts. She's very good at noticing patterns. But when it comes to dealing with human beings, not necessarily so good. And when we do see her having interactions, they're very bizarre interactions. One of the things that we see Rose doing is she goes to bars to pick up random men. Now, this seems completely atypical to what we've already learned about Rose in the very few moments that we've met her in the movie before this. But then we realize 
realize that it is part of the larger circle of things that she does. So she goes and takes a guy into the bathroom and she essentially jacks him off, uh, and gives him a little bit of sexual favor. But the reality is she seems somewhat turned off by the whole biological production. What she wants, though, is the biology that the guy is going to emit. So she essentially stores his semen, leaves him there with his pants down, says thank you very much, and leaves. This is part of an experiment. What is she possibly working on? Well, she is harvesting biological material for a specific purpose, which we will get to. First, let's talk about the second character in here, Celie Morales. She's a nurse. She is a maternity nurse. So her life is consumed by helping women give birth trying to keep women up and afloat during this painful process. And she is a single mother. Her daughter's name is Lila, and Lila is the love of her life. But to be quite fair, if we are being honest, Lila comes in second to the career. Celie has to make the choice, the painful choice that many single mothers have to do, which is you're going to have to lose and sacrifice some time from the child to be able to have that career. And try as she might, she has to rely on the neighbors to help bring up this child as she goes for longer and longer hours to be able, of course, take care of the vicious cycle of being a mother and how expensive it is to have a kid and all of that stuff being a single parent. She's in that cycle. And so one day, Celia is ready to send her daughter Lila to school and Lila's not feeling well. So she has to get to work and she carts the child off to the next door neighbor who's more than happy to take care of the child, lets her know that she's feeling a little bit sick. And what Celie has been doing at work is she will lock herself into the bathroom or in a hospital closet for a few moments to have some sleep because she is burning the candle at both ends. So of course she falls asleep. And this one time, of course, she's in the bathroom doing this and she drops her phone into the bowl and boom, wet phone, no longer working at this moment. This becomes very crucial because her daughter's getting sicker. So when the phone finally does come back online, she is barraged by all these messages. She doesn't seem to be doing very well. We didn't send her to school. She seems to be getting worse. Please call back. Please get in touch with us. We're heading to the hospital now. And so the terror mounts and she knows that her daughter is coming to this hospital. And so she rushes to find her daughter. And what she finds out is that her daughter had bacterial meningitis and she's died. She missed saying goodbye. She missed being there for her daughter. So she is paralyzed with the horror of what has happened. Now, these two women seemingly on two different career paths, seemingly on two different worlds, are about to connect because Lila's body ends up on the autopsy table of Rose. Next thing that we know, Lila's body disappears from the morgue. Celia's trying to find it. What we find out is that Rose has been taking this biological material from men, biological material from pregnant women, and biological material from herself on an experiment bringing dead material back to life and that's as far as i'm going to go with talking about this movie suffice to say that this gets dark pretty quick and where it goes is even darker and it's not just the idea of there perhaps being a monster it's the monsters that we become from obsession and from grief Birth Rebirth is an excellent updating of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The next movie in my list continues the trend of going back to the source of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein for a telling of a story and also giving us a focal switch on what our story is about or who the story is about. And this is also another first-time director. The movie is The Angry Black Girl and Her Monster, and it is directed and written by Bomani J. Story, S-T-O-R-Y. What a great last name for this kind of stuff, right? So the story takes place in the neighborhood of a 17-year-old girl, Vicaria, 
who's lost many members of her family and friends to urban violence that's around in the neighborhood. This is an area of a city where essentially you have the drug dealers very well known by everybody in the neighborhood and they have a couch at the top of a hill that looks over the entire complex that they lord over. And yet life just continues to go on. There's a very strange fairy tale kind of feel to the way that this story is told. It's kind of like the wonder years in its structure of discussing the deep seated thoughts of the main character. And Vicaria is kind of a genius. She's one of those girls who's going to overcome whatever's happening in her world, or she's going to try her best to do that. And the thing is, she is obsessed, just like Dr. Frankenstein. She's obsessed by death because death is striking very closely. And the opening montage, we get to see all the stuff that's been happening in her life. And we see that her brother, who was talked into being part of the world of crime around her household is shot and killed. We don't necessarily know at that time who killed him, but he does take a bullet to the head and somebody drags his body away. We find out it doesn't really give away much to say that it is Vicaria and Vicaria herself has become thoroughly obsessed with trying to bring life back to a dead body. And she's decided that her brother is the one that she's going to try and do this with. Now, sprinkled around this fantasy horror idea, and it definitely goes into horror, my friends, is just the way that this world that we are asked to walk into works. There's something really sad and engrossing about how in a situation like this, where there is good and there is evil, uh, and it is so obviously intertwined with what's happening in the neighborhood, in the culture, in the world that these people live in, that it's not even like it's not even like there's a separation between the good and the evil. Of course, there are people who are partaking and there are people who are not partaking. It's almost at a business level. Everybody knows who the drug dealer is. Everybody knows what they do. And the drug dealer patiently waits for those who are the final holdouts to finally get working for him or taking his supply. And there is just this ambivalence. So there is this idea of the, the banality of evil. And so it's just part of life now that there are these people who are there to cause you great harm. Some things that are also very good about this is that you see how hard it is to get out of a world like that. So Vicaria's father is taking her to a white school where she sticks out, of course, like a sore thumb, where there are different criteria between how the teacher responds to the white students and how the teacher responds to the black student and also how the black student overcompensates. But once she reanimates the monster, her brother, things get really interesting. And this is where it definitely delves into horror. And this is where, as I mentioned before, how do I tell that something's horror? It's what emotion does the filmmaker want you to go home with? This one goes pretty dark, folks. It talks about how the choices that we make inside of the world that we're in affects everybody. Vengeance rarely just goes in one direction and only hits the target it's supposed to. So what's really disturbing about this movie is that there are consequences to every little thing that Vicaria does. And those consequences don't just hit the guys that are sitting on that couch on the hill. It comes home to roost. I highly recommend The Angry Black Girl and Her Monster, one of the killer elite of 2023. I have a, shall we say, complicated relationship with alien abduction movies. 
So it's not like I have any actual experience myself with them, mind you. But what I find is as as, as a subgenre, alien abduction films tend to be very procedural. They start with a kind of a splash, and then it's a lot of is this real, who done it, who done her, all that stuff until we get the reveal of whether or not it was actually an alien abduction. So movies like Fire in the Sky or Communion, for the most part, they're not very engaging to me, but then there are the moments where they have the actual alien abduction and they're some of the most riveting, visceral, terrifying moments in films. So that brings me to the next movie on my list, which is an entire movie comprised of those moments. Essentially, you have uh, an entire running time of these encounters with aliens. And the movie is No One Will Save You. And it's directed by Brian Duffield. Now, Brian, this is his first film as a director. He's done a lot of screenplays. He did the screenplay to The Babysitter. He was also the producer for Cocaine Bear. So already he's going to have a lot of people pumping for him that this is going to be great. One of the reasons that I think this movie really works for me is that it's a time bomb movie. So it takes place in uh, as close as you can be in real time. And so from the very beginning of the movie to the very end of the movie, we're basically stuck in the situation with the character, the main character. Another thing that usually kills these movies is that you're usually dragged down by psychobabble uh, dialogue. There's this thing of there has to be more to it than just aliens running around, I guess. And so these movies usually have long stretches of people talking. Well, this one's very unique. This is a movie where there's no dialogue whatsoever. There's almost, di well, I shouldn't say no dialogue, but there's extremely small amounts of dialogue and none, if I remember correctly, with our main character. This is basically a movie where it's the actions and the reactions and almost said things to other people that really add to the suspense and keep the thing moving. So the the star of this movie is Caitlin Deaver, and Caitlin is someone that I kind of fell in love with as an actress from her time in Justified, where she played a teenager who gets revenge on these people who poisoned her daddy uh, with bad moonshine. And she's grown up a bit now, and I have to say, as an action star, she does a pretty darn good job. So No One Will Save You is a movie in some town somewhere uh, that we never really get named. Uh, Bryn is their main character, and she's coming out of some great trauma where her mother was lost and her best friend named Maud was lost. Whatever happened, we're not quite exactly sure, and we're not quite sure what her part was in it, because she's kind of ostracized from the rest of her town. So she essentially stays indoors when she's not doing whatever work she needs to do, when she's not going to uh, the store, which is always fraught with trouble because she's going to be recognized by somebody. She's going to have someone from her past try to speak to her and then think better of it. So we see this person in complete and utter isolation. And then one night, all this weird stuff starts to happen around town. Bryn is in bed and she hears an intruder. Someone's breaking into her house. And so she goes downstairs and it is truly someone not from the neighborhood. And so we have our first moment with an alien. And yes, I've already told you that it was an alien abduction. Listen, okay, I... I will admit that I guess I gave up the ghost there, but let's just say that the entertaining piece of this isn't trying to figure out who the intruders are. It's how is she going to get out of this? And, you know, when you're in a movie called No One Will Save You, uh, it's already like the movie's giving out some of its secrets. Now, I'm not going to say that it gives out uh, the secret that you're thinking of, but you're going to be surprised with where this movie goes. I found the suspense of it being a real time. Uh, the clock starts when she wakes up in bed and it doesn't end until the uh, pretty wild finale, which is very satirical and 
perhaps darker than one might think. I, I kind of look at the end of this as it's got that weird bleakness that movies like Brazil have. So anyway, no one will save you. Some really cool aliens, some cool effects, some really strong moments of suspense, a lot of action, and a really good main character. The actress in it does a fantastic job of holding a movie together for an entire runtime without being able to say a word. I highly recommend No One Will Save You. It is one of the odd choices of mine, but it is still firmly in my camp of Killer Elite of 2023. Okay, so, you know, you might have noticed that this is a long episode jam-packed with a lot of movies, and you know what? I could not help myself. Again, as I said in the beginning, it is really hard for me to make lists, especially best-ofs or top tens. Top ten, obviously, I obliterated and destroyed that. So, back to what I was saying. I ended up having to watch, at the end of the year, many movies and just make a ton of lists and hope that I could compile something together because what ends up happening when you're doing this kind of thing is you realize that you can't see everything and sometimes the bigger movies get pushed to the side or the movies that you're like I'm not quite sure what I think of that so I ended up having to watch some in kind of a marathon at the end so some movies were added and some movies that yeah, didn't change my mind whatsoever now, with that, there are some big movies that came out in the last year that I may not have brought up yet, and uh, maybe they'll be on the list, maybe not, but I'll tell you, at the end of this episode, if you haven't heard, I didn't like it, okay? Uh, some people ask me, well, you never seem to talk about some of these big movies and stuff, and it's like, yeah, I try not to denigrate, I just <laughs> kind of omit, and so if I don't talk about the movie, if I don't laud the movie, chances are if it's on everybody's tongue and everybody's seen it and everybody's talking about it and I'm not, chances are it didn't make my end of year killer elite. Now with that said, we're now going into another, ah, well, a proclivity of mine. Even in the year thing, I have a really hard time picking a number one. The best that I tend to do, and you'll just have to live with this with me, is that I can take it to a triumvirate. I can make three movies. And each of these are interchangeable in what I consider the best movie. So there's no order in these last three, but these last three are separate from the others that I had. This would be what I consider the cream of the crop of the killer elite. I think all of these movies, if you haven't seen them, I strongly urge you to see them. I'm confident that you're really going to like them. And with that, I guess I'll just start up. So here we go. There's only one horror movie that has any Oscar nominations, and it is for visual effects. And that is Godzilla Minus One. And that is one of the, uh, the great ones of this last year. Godzilla Minus One, it's interesting. As its popularity rises, because it was a small movie, it was a medium-sized budget, uh, it kind of slept walk its way into theaters. And it was only supposed to show for a short period of time in a few theaters. And it blew box office records out. Because it's that damn good. Now, there's been some backlash against Godzilla Minus One that I'll never understand. So it's almost like this thing, like people are pissed because uh, people are turning their back on, on some of the American versions that have come out and things. And, and, and those versions are from not so great to okay to fine. But this one, Godzilla Minus One, takes us back to 1963. 60 years after the first movie, we have a relevance to the monster that hadn't been there since that first film. Now, with that said, uh, the effects are fantastic. This small movie really delivers. You don't have to care about the sociopolitical side of things to think that Godzilla Minus One is so great. But my God, if you don't, you're missing out on watching. A culture again 
reassess itself and look at its past and embrace, hold on to its past, accept what has happened and move forward, which is what the amazing thing was about Godzilla back in 1963. The original Godzilla was essentially about nuclear bombs being dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the reckoning that came from the Japanese people themselves. And so there is this idea of a culpability of what have we wrought against ourselves, having this God up here. So essentially, when the original Godzilla came out, uh, people fainted in the audience, uh, there was weeping, and it became this cultural icon, this identity for 60 years. Godzilla is still revered because it was this primal scream allowed out, and it also turn the fortunes, correct? I mean, Toho made some money on this. It gave Japan an identity that wasn't the war. Really interesting stuff that goes on with Godzilla and who doesn't love a giant monster movie? Those of us who love these movies continue to go back to why is this black and white one? Why is that one so important? Why do, why do we keep going back to it? And it's because it has some emotional power. Godzilla minus one has amazing emotional power. I was stunned to be in a movie theater watching this movie getting emotional. This is the end of World War II, and we have a kamikaze pilot. He says that there's a problem with his plane, and he goes to this island. And, and, you know, guess what island he goes to? Well, Odo Island. And so he meets these mechanics who are there, and they kind of know that he's shamed himself or dishonored himself, and they don't care because they realize what this war has wrought for them and that there's nothing there for them, you know, that this has destroyed their lives. And it's a very somber thing that we see right there. And this is a story about finding a character and finding courage after, after having just run and escaped. This movie talks about uh, the government's not going to help you. It's going to be us reforming, rebuilding. And so... While this kamikaze pilot is on Odo Island, Godzilla attacks. And when we first see Godzilla, he's just about T-Rex dinosaur size. You know, at first I'm looking at him going, that's Godzilla for this movie? Really? And what's great is that they treat Godzilla walking around like, oh shit, it's Godzilla. Like, this is like a bear appearing in a camp or, you know, some other dangerous being. And he ends up destroying the place because of a cowardly act someone who does not act when they could anyway our kamikaze pilot survives not many others do and he goes back to tokyo and he goes to a tokyo that is absolutely destroyed and they spend a lot of time showing us just how devastating the war was to tokyo we think of hiroshima we think of nagasaki they're vaporized right but what is left of Tokyo? And so we see people living in squalor, no electricity. It's winter. People are dead and families are separated. And so we see a small family build around tragedy. Our kamikaze pilot goes back to his family home to find how his parents are dead. And he finds this woman with a child hiding there. And we find out the woman is not the mother of the child. She saved this child that was just left somewhere and she's taken responsibility for it and she's got nowhere to go and she's starving. And so they all stay in his destroyed house and the next door neighbor who's lost her family, her children, gives them some rice so everybody doesn't starve. This is the kind of character development that's going on in this monster movie, right? But of course, that kind of thing goes so far. This is a Godzilla movie, right? So we finally see Godzilla, who finally gets some irradiation and becomes the Godzilla of the Godzilla size we're expecting. And a lot of this movie takes place at sea. And this may be about as suspenseful as scenes in Jaws. <laughs> there are moments that I was so in love with in the theater. I'm so glad I saw this movie in the theater because the gasps of people watching this how beautifully orchestrated this medium budget horror movie with Godzilla was in creating suspense, making the models look real, practical effects as well as CG, all of this stuff working together. 
and it also still gets pretty nasty. So one of the things that isn't in this Godzilla movie, which might make people's hair stand on end, is there's no attack on Tokyo. Tokyo is already destroyed. Instead, Godzilla goes after Ginza. Now, that's not a place most Americans are going to know, but Ginza, it had a grand history. It was the golden city of old Japan. So the old world of Japan was best seen in Ginza. And it was a place of hustle and bustle and beauty. And we destroyed it, right? The, the allies and the Americans just absolutely laid it to waste. Not only did we lay it to waste, we let people starve. And we <laughs> built uh, MacArthur's compound there. And they had huge neon signs while no one had electricity. The Americans put up huge neon signs saying Merry Christmas. And they made postcards out of the destruction of Ginza and sent those back to family of soldiers to inspire them. So there's a nasty little bite. Why Ginza? Why indeed? It made me look it up. And I hope it makes other people look it up. But in the end, it comes down to how suspenseful is it? How are the characters that are in it? How good is Godzilla? I think Godzilla is fantastic. I think the water sequences are great. I think the attack on Ginza is jaw-droppingly good. Uh, there are moments that you don't expect to happen. There are poetic moments in the action. And the director is Yamazaki Takashi. And he has worked a lot. He's been uh, doing things like a Battleship Yamamoto. Uh, I think he was involved with promoting the Tokyo Olympics. He made the movies for the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, many, many movies inside of the science fiction, fantasy, and horror genres. And most with a medium budget. And so when he was asked to make this, he was saying, you know, Shin Godzilla had come out and he's going, oh my God, they're going to ask, Toho is going to ask me to do this. I have to follow up Shin Godzilla, which he thought was really good. He said he loved the original Godzilla and he felt that he should stay true to that spirit, addressing the issues of war, nuclear weapons. There's a concept in Japan called Tatarigami. There are good gods and there are bad gods. Godzilla's half monster, but he's also half God. Is he good? Is he bad? Well, you know, watch the movie and see what your thoughts are on it. Godzilla Minus One, one of the great movies of 2023. I talked about alien abduction movies earlier, and I have a few things that I've, I've talked about on different shows that are movies that, as subgenres... They really excite me and also really disappoint me most of the time. And uh, it, that would be ghost stories and possession, demonic possession films. Those movies, ghost stories and demonic possession films, for the first two acts are the scariest things ever. They really affect me viscerally. And then the last act is, oh, you got ghosts or, oh, you got a demon. Well, we'll just send in the doctors, the priests, and they'll take care of it. And the movie shrinks, especially when we're talking about demonic possession. I mean, for demonic possession, nothing's scarier than the idea of being prey to a predator that you can't see and no one believes you, right? That's the, the usual thing that happens. The first two acts, absolutely terrifying. But then we get bogged down. We get bogged down in exorcistitis and I'm finally tired of The Exorcist after 50 years. It's not as much that I'm tired of The Exorcist, that it's not a scary movie or anything. I'm not sure I like its relevance anymore. And I think that it's been done so often that it did it right so much that everybody does the exact same damn thing. And it's stuck in that. But it's also stuck in its own dogma. One of the things that I'm tired of talking about or hearing people talk about is how it's not a horror movie. It's more about this fight about good and evil. And then I start wondering why The Exorcist was so big. Is this actually just a promotional tool for a certain church? Now, the idea that in the end, no matter what's happened in the first two acts, it's going to be the movie shrinks down to the size of a bed or the size of a chair someone's tied to or the, a barn or a basement, wherever it is, it becomes static. It's trapped and guys shouting incantations and like doctors doing house calls all you need to do is get the exorcist there and it's gonna be okay and that's how it ends it's so predictable 
Of course, there's a big budget version of a remake this year that, uh, you know, I'm not bringing up here (laughs) outside of to say this, that it came out and it's not the exorcist I think we needed. I think from talking with people is that a secular world, the exorcist isn't as scary. The idea of when I was a kid, there was very much uh, deep-seated religion in most households. It had this extra added heft, the idea of blasphemy, walking the edge of what is sacred and what is blasphemous. All of that stuff, I think, made the exorcist scarier, more of a belief, a religious story, not a spiritual story, but the religious side of this, has it run its course. What do we do in a secular world? Well, what we do is one of the great movies of 2023, and that is Damien Rugna's When Evil Lurks. Not where evil lurks, when evil lurks. In other words, it's an inevitability. It's not, oh, if you go over there, if you touch this thing or you do that, that evil's going to get to you. No, it's coming. You know, it's like, it's like COVID now. Sooner or later, you're going to get fucking COVID now, my friend, thanks to the world being as it is. And I would say that this is kind of a pandemic version of a possession, that there are things that are at play in this movie. There are characters and an ignorance that's happening that is reminiscent of some of the things that we just may be purging ourselves, exercising ourselves from as a culture, as a world culture. Damien Rugna blew my mind with Terrified, the first movie that he released. And this is his follow-up. Terrified was a great ghost story that took the problems that I usually see in ghost stories and uh, worked around them in a very original way. If you haven't seen Terrified, I would say see that. Now, that's not... Damien Leone's Terrifier, that's a whole different story, uh, although I do like the original. Terrified is an Argentinian film, and there have been some really good Argentinian horror films of recent. And When Evil Lurks is truly great. This is a movie not for the faint of heart. All bets are off in this movie. This is one of the best representations of evil. Like, you can almost feel like there's evil on the film itself, that it's it's wafting off onto the audience while you're watching it. I haven't seen or felt that since, well, actually, not too long ago, uh, 2020, The Dark and the Wicked, Brian Bertino's film, and that movie was really dark. Well, welcome to the other side of the dark. I forget what the name of the blackest black is. They've now created this cobalt black or something. Like, you look into it and universes disappear. <laughs> it's a paint. Well, this movie may have been painted in that form of black. When Evil Lurks is jaw-droppingly odd, original, violent, crazy, inspired, and artistic. It starts literally with a bang in the dead of night Two brothers who live together on their farm hear gunshots. And we're learning the world through their eyes. Nothing is telegraphed. They're like, it sounds like it might be poachers, but maybe not. Maybe it could be something else. We hear a little bit of it might be the neighbor who may or may not like them. And so they wait till morning. And when they go out there, they find a disemboweled, torn in half human body. And some kind of apparatus that's damaged and and bent and destroyed. And it looks like a sailor sextant and a few other things all rolled into one. They have no idea what's going on, but they know this interloper obviously is dead and they're not sure what did it. At first, they think it might be an animal, but then they realize that the types of cuts that are there, the wounds are surgical. Somebody cut this person like this. So they need to go talk to the person whose land it is. As the story slowly unfolds, we find out that on this land, there are some migrant workers and one of them is sick and they've been sick for a while. What are they sick from? Well, they're called the rotten. The rotten is when evil, an evil entity, something like that, we don't even really know. Is it a demon? Is it a monster? It's just evil. It gets inside of someone. There are certain things that can be done 
by specialty groups, not necessarily saying a church, but a group of people who know how to end these things. You can't just kill them. You can't shoot them. It spreads the disease. You can't bludgeon them to death. It spreads the disease. There's a specific way and a specific routine that needs to be done. And it's like everybody knows this. So what's cool about this movie is you're dropped into a universe that already exists and it just tells you to keep up. And keep up you must. And I will say that it is shocking where this movie goes. What's really amazing about this movie is how it goes where you think it's not going to go. There's a lot of gore. And there are moments that you see coming and you're praying that they're not going to happen. But they do. And the evil is just all over this movie. What's really cool about When Evil Lurks is that there's not one mention of religion. There is mention, well, there is mention of religion. Religion is gone. God is not listening. We are told this. We have no idea what's happened. This is something that evil is just there. Has nothing to do with a specific belief or a church. It's just something that is there inherent in the world. And the way that Damien Rugna creates this world that we get to watch is really phenomenal. I don't want to go into it anymore. I may have said too much already. What I've said will not prepare you for some of the things that are going to happen. This is one of those movies because of how just relentlessly horrific it is. It has made old horror fans giddy, which is a really disturbing thing to say, but it's true. It is a movie that inspires you that an old style of horror or a unbridled style of horror, a transgressive or gonzo style of horror is still alive and well. When something is good, it transcends the uh, worries and roadblocks of studio heads and it gets out there and it infects people just like a disease. So when evil lurks, my goodness, a great film, masterful, a must-see, certainly one of the top three, Killer Elite. Now, speaking of movies that remind me of an old-style horror movie, that's this next movie I'm going to speak about. This is a movie that works right up against the innocence and the haunting. This is a movie that is M.R. Jamesian in its style, story, and most importantly, its ending. This is a movie that got hyped a lot when it first came out. Hype can sometimes be a killer. And a lot of times, the movies that get hyped, I'm not necessarily a big fan of. I go and I see them, and at times I'm underwhelmed. And a lot of movies of recent don't know how to stick the end. There's this kind of let down. They let the audience off the hook or they just kind of just float away. Sticking the ending's been a hard part. Some really good movies of the past 20 years don't know how to end. They kind of just end with the credits. They kind of end with a cheap jump scare. Very few movies have the confidence to end their story like literature ends. And that brings me to Talk To Me. Another first feature film by the Flippo brothers, Danny and Michael. This is a film made in Australia. It's an A24 film. I bring that up because so many people are like, oh, A24, A24. I, I can't tell you that I feel the same. Talk to Me is a magnificent ghost story slash possession. It mixes those two, right? It's either a very disturbing ghost or a demon that haunts. I think this is a really strong movie. And it's not just great because of the horror elements that are obvious. You know, uh, the idea of gore or the, the, the scares that are inherent in the story. This is well done. The characters that are in this movie, the actors in this film, are really, really strong. They give great naturalistic performances. This is the first time in a while where I have felt watching a party of teenagers that I felt like I was watching teenagers, that it felt like a real party. And that may sound like a small thing, but acting is what makes this movie really sing. This is a low budget movie. There are not a lot of effects. There are some, there's blood, but for the most part, the things that are chilling about this movie can be summed up with Black contact lenses and acting. The actors bring this to life. The haunt 
the terror is all there in the acting. So the movie starts with a party and there's some game that's going on, a party game. And it's a cruel party game. And that there's a level of cruelty to teenagers. There is sadism, and especially as teens, we can be horrible to each other. And we will do anything to not be the brunt of those jokes and we will do anything to be popular. And in this movie, that there's a total disrespect, disregard for the sanctity of life, shall we say, that life and death are trivialized by the teenager who's so far removed from it. So in the beginning, we see this party and there is this game going on that we don't quite understand. But one teenage boy locks himself in a bedroom and his brother comes to get him. And when he opens up the door, he finds that his brother is wounded. He's trying to get him out of this, this party while everybody's dancing and singing and carrying on while his brother is wounded and bleeding. And all of a sudden, the wounded brother stabs his brother in the chest and then stabs himself in the face over and over again, killing himself in front of everybody in this party. And then we cut to the present where we meet Mia. And she's a 17-year-old girl. She's struggling. She is an outsider. And one of the things she's struggling with is that her mother committed suicide two years earlier. And she has a very distant relationship with her father. And all she wants to do is be liked. And she has a few friends that will take her different places. She has a best friend named Jade. And they find out that there's going to be a party. And she begs to go to this party. And her friend says, absolutely, we'll take you there. And we want you to get out. We want you to have a good life. All of that stuff. All she wants to do is fit in, right? As soon as she gets to this party, the kids are perfectly cruel, right? The kid who can get away with it throws shade and everybody just makes a joke and it goes on and they ignore her. Boy, if I, I only wish I could tell you I didn't know what that felt like. <laughs> so we get to the party game. And the party game has to do with this weird statue of an outstretched hand with all this arcane writing on it. And allegedly, of course, as the story goes, there's actually the hand of a witch inside of there that's been covered with plaster and it's just a prop now for talking to the other world it's its own self-contained ouija board now how one of the boys from the party has this where it came from none of that needs to be explained like a good ghost story we just fall right into the world that we are given and so of course there are certain things that need to be done and certain things that must not be done Anybody who wants to play the game, who wants to have a traveler, a visitor, come into their body for just a small period of time, they have to do certain things. Now, before I go any further with this, I want to bring up that I know these kind of games. We used to do whippets and things like that. Now, obviously, you know, don't go do whippets, kids. But uh, we used to do things to make ourselves high and lose our minds a little bit. Even as kids, we had I had a group of friends who would get on a merry-go-round, one of those really small children's merry-go-rounds, and we'd spin it as fast as we could with one person in the center. And they would get off of the thing, and they would stagger as if insanely drunk. You know, their inner ear is completely fucked, and they'd flop on the ground, and we would laugh our asses off, and we would all do it individually. This weird dare of altering ourselves, taking us somewhere that we normally are not. And so I know that the, this is the kind of thing that is a bonding tool. Get fucked up. Find a way to be fucked up. And what they do here is they find a way to get fucked up to allow a ghost into you, an entity, a presence for a very short period of time. What you need to do is you have to sit across from the hand. You put the hand in your hand and you say, talk to me. And that's the first step. You allow this connection to happen between you and whatever's on the other side. And then you say, I let you in. When that happens, you allow this thing into you and you have to get it out within 90 seconds after that terrible things happen why 90 seconds who the fuck cares nobody knows this is the same thing as guillermo del toro used to talk about where all the great old stories where you had to take three of something three hairs off the devil's back you know why three who knows maybe it's a trinity who knows it just works we don't ask those questions so it's 90 seconds here 
I let you in. At first, nobody wants to do it. And Mia, just wanting to fit in, says, I'll do it. So she does it. And great, great acting by Sophie Wilde as Mia. When this thing is in her, the choices of how it makes her act and talk are really creepy. I love how this movie does this. It's almost as if the entity itself is drunk inside of this body and it wants to stay. And there's a chilling nature to almost a seductiveness that's happening. And it becomes a party act. Everybody, when they see this weird thing happen to Mia and her eyes go big and her head goes back, that is kind of like when we were kids and we'd wait for the guy who drank the shot of Everclear to go, and everybody go, yes, you're one of us. That's exactly how you're supposed to act when this kind of thing happens. And it becomes a party game where everybody is having fun, forgetting that at the center of this is death, and someone has died, and you're toying with this weird game. So what ends up happening? Well, let's just say that for some people, what happens under the presence doesn't do people the best for their health and other people may or may not go over that 90 seconds and what happens to them is really intriguing and really the crux of where the rest of this movie goes there's a little bit of revenge in this movie like a revenge ghost thing there's a possession side to it there is children having to learn not to play with dead things And there is great scares and a maturity of storytelling where not everything is telegraphed. Not every parent is an idiot. People talk to each other like people normally talk to each other. And the ending is magnificent. When I saw it in the theater, I was hoping it was going where I thought it was going. And in the end, I went, oh my God, M.R. James would have blown you a kiss. Talk to me really does speak to me. And I hope it does the same for you. That is one of the great movies of 2023. One of the top three of the killer elite. And if you have a chance, see those. And that's my list, my long list of the killer elite. The movies that I felt were absolutely fantastic this year. Uh, Really enjoyable year as far as I'm concerned. So many different styles of horror, so many different sub-genres. There was something of excellence coming from all these different areas. And I hope that this, at least one or two of these movies you haven't seen, that you decide to go out and take a look at because of what I said about them. And if there are movies that you think should have been there, feel free to reach out to me. You know how to get in touch with me. My, my, uh, My... digits are out there on my website hellbentforhorror.com I'd love to hear from you if you have an idea of a movie that perhaps I missed now with that I have to have one last one folks I just have to have one last one and I keep this as an honorable mention because it doesn't really fit but it is so good so important so worthy of praise and it's nothing more than a special feature on a box set of movies that came from Vinegar Syndrome. It's a feature-length documentary, and it's all about preserving film. So it's not even about horror directly. It's tangentially about horror movies. This is part of a box set that Vinegar Syndrome put out called Vinegar Syndrome's Lost Picture Show. These are movies that were lost to time, that were found by their intrepid folks who are constantly along with people like Severin Pictures and Synapse Pictures and so many others boutique uh, labels that are taking old films that are kind of forgotten and restoring them bringing them back to whatever glory that they can or at least making a print releasable this is a movie about preservation and restoration of movies that maybe Martin Scorsese and those guys at the film foundations probably wouldn't give a second look to These are the movies lost, the B movies, the second on the bill at old drive-in shows, things that only played grindhouses for a weekend. These movies still are part of our cultural thread. 
the cultural fabric that we have, whether or not you think that they are good, deserve to at least be seen. And so there are some really crazy movies that are in this box set, but the thing that makes me truly inspired, makes me happy to be a cineast, makes me happy to be doing this, makes me happy to meet my friends. This is why we get together to talk at different conventions and we stay up all night talking about movies. There is something to film that is so important. And this is the story of how Vinegar Syndrome and, as I said, several other boutique groups have tirelessly gone in search of these movies. And there's a great call out to Mike Vraney, who started Something Weird. And Something Weird is one of those touchstones to cult film. Many of the movies like the Coffin Joe series, I only know because Mike Vraney out of Seattle ended up uh, getting these movies and putting them out on videotape in the 80s and 90s. And so this is a movie about those guys and the modern versions of them and what you need to go through and how they find some of these movies and how it's just lost the time and how the directors didn't even know that these movies were around. And then searching to try and find who owns the rights? Does anybody even own these rights? What's going on? This is a love letter to everyone who loves movies. This is a love letter to those of us who can't throw anything away. You know, I still have love letters in a box somewhere from people who probably don't even know I exist anymore, but I could never throw them away because it's a piece of me. And those of us who take film seriously, that have pieces of us in these things, I cannot recommend a documentary any higher than Against the Grain. The people that it celebrates are people who will probably never be celebrated again. The movies that are celebrated could be forgotten. These are Solieri's students at the end of Amadeus. This is what I think movie making is all about. This is storytelling. And the idea of the, the absolute love that there is to just see the thing you haven't seen yet, to experience the piece of film that's been lost. The idea that some of us can't look at a box that has a, a, a latch on it and not unlatch it to find out what's in there. That's what Against the Grain's about. I cannot recommend it higher. And I hope that you've enjoyed this show. I hope you take some of these movies into your heart. And until next time, stay hell bent, my friends. And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. Please hit that subscribe button to get H4H hot off the press. And if you can do a review on iTunes or whatever app you listen to us on, that really helps people get to find us. And now for some Hellbent for Horror news. The podcast is available on some more outlets now, so you can listen to H4H on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio, as well as the regular iTunes, Android, and Amazon apps. And let there be swag. H4H t-shirts are now on sale. We have a store on tpublic.com with a bunch of Hellbent for Horror designs, and you can have your choice of t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, something horrible beautiful for you or that someone special. The link to the merchandise store is on our website, hellbentforhorror.com. And until we meet again, stay hellbent.